Hello everybody, welcome back to Ohio Has Issues. I'm Stephanie Haney. I'm Mike Polk Jr. and you are watching Ohio's best show about Ohio politics. We try to give you all the information that you need as we go careening towards this very monumental election day of November 5th that will decide so much about how our nation and our state moves forward. Yes, careening is the word. 27 days to November 5th, which is Election Day, and early voting is already on in Ohio, so if that's your thing, you can go ahead and get out there and get things taken care of. I like how we talk about that as if it's like a lifestyle choice, you know? If you're an early voter, <laughs> go do it. your thing. We're not here to judge. We're not mm -hmm. going to kink shame you for early voting. Get out there and do it. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. And it's official, so that, that means this election's going on. Mm -hmm. Remember how many months ago? We've been doing this for months now, and we were talking about this like it was sort of like an imagined thing that might happen someday, but maybe not, and now it's here. It is. It's right here, so Horrifying. we're going to hopefully get you a little more ready for it than you were before you joined with us today. Uh, we've got a great sh show for you today. Uh, interesting lawsuit that was brought to my attention that we're going to be talking about. We'll I'm interested to hear about this. You have a good interview with Mark Dan. Yes, yes. A Cleveland attorney who is in the middle of a lawsuit over federal unemployment money that he says Governor Mike DeWine refuses to give to Ohio citizens mm -hmm. for no good reason. So we'll be talking with him about that. That's right. We're also going to be talking to Jake Zuckerman who has a, he's from Cleveland.com, great writer who's a friend of the show. He's got a great piece about a new Ohio judgment uh, that the Supreme Court is going to be taking up, a case that the Supreme Court is going to be taking up regarding gun rights here in Ohio, and whether or not, did you know that you are legally not allowed to drink currently in Ohio bars if you are armed with a gun? I do believe I did know that piece of information, right. yes. Might not be for long. In mm -hmm. fact, in three counties right now, you actually can legally drink while in a bar while uh, have, playing with a gun or having wow. it right there next to you if you want to. And there's a lawsuit about this that the Ohio, or th there's a case about this that the Ohio Supreme Court agreed to take up. We're going to be deciding very soon whether or not, apparently, you can uh, be uh, drunk with a gun in a bar. Wow. Okay. So we're going to talk about that with Jake. Well, I look forward to hearing mm -hmm. all about the details on that one. And of course, we're going to give you your updates on the Senate and, and VP races because, you know, we have Ohioan J.D. Vance, you might have heard, is actually the candidate uh, for the Republican Party this year. So we've been keeping you up to date on that. And we have one of the most important Senate races, races, probably the most important Senate race as far as we're concerned, in the country right now could be deciding the balance of the Senate. And we'll be telling you about that. And okay, also a couple more congressional races that we want to bring you up to speed with, among some other things. We're going to get started with that actually in our Ohio roundup. Yeah, sometimes we give these the short shrift, I believe is the word. Is that it? I think short so. Short shrift because we talk so much about the Senate, the super important Senate thing. And plus, frankly, because our, our districts are so badly gerrymandered right now that these cases very rarely even all, are all that important. Like they, these, these are usually pretty well decided before things um, you know, really shake out. Comes down to the primary. Yeah. At least for now, that may change when issue one does or does not pass. We will talk about that later. But to those congressional races. You found a couple of interesting races that you wanted to touch on with some interesting facts. Tell us about Ohio's 7th District House race. Yeah, this is the race between Republican Max Miller, that's mm -hmm. the incumbent, and the Democratic candidate Matthew Deemer, and also a storied Cleveland area politician, independent Dennis Kucinich. That's right. Uh, he did not get the Democratic uh, endorsement, and so he ran as an independent and he was the boy mayor of Cleveland in the late 70s, and he has been a longtime Ohio political fixture, and he actually earned himself a pretty impressive endorsement from the Plain Dealer, which was surprising to a lot of people, I understand. Yeah, uh, let's talk about those endorsements. Mm -hmm. he, he got that endorsement for his congressional experience mm -hmm. because he was in the U.S. House representing Ohio from 1997 to 2013, and they said that he came prepared to answer their questions. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Democratic candidate, who they said was not satisfactory and doesn't have enough experience quite yet, and Max Miller, who refused to participate in the process, the Republican. And so they, they are endorsing Dennis Kucinich. Something interesting about this is that Dennis Kucinich is actually in the process of suing Cleveland.com, the plane dealer, and Chris Quinn, the editor, for defamation. And in spite of that, he still earned their endorsement. So wow. strange bedfellows in strange times. Yeah, that yeah. is interesting. I do remember specifically reading in the letter from the editor from Chris Quinn this time around that he was saying, they're not saying Dennis Kucinich is the perfect candidate. They're not even actually saying that he's a good candidate, but they are saying that they prefer him as the candidate over Max Miller and Deemer. Now, from what I understand, if you are a Dennis Kucinich fan, you have a chance, you could meet him this Sunday at a private location for a fundraising event, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, he's been going to events actually with RFK Jr. He's had a couple of them. There's one this Saturday. We don't know where uh, that one will be, Saturday and Sunday. It's kind of a two-day thing from what I understand. And then 
uh, a few weeks ago, he held an event at Majestic Hall. And what's interesting about that is that's a space that's owned by Cleveland business owner Tony George, who is no stranger to making headlines himself. Mm -hmm. Tony George was named as a go-between in the first Energy House Bill 6 bribery scandal and also is the father of Bobby George, who currently is facing charges for attempted murder, rape, and kidnapping. Um, so Max Miller was elected in 2022, and he's just now finishing his first term in the U.S. House. And the US, we actually have some tea about the re a relationship situation going on with him right now. And I would say an inopportune time when you are running for re-election, uh, your father-in-law is running for Senate, and Donald Trump, who was you originally worked for, is running for president. And what is going on with him right now? Yeah, it's been a uh, kind of an ugly divorce situation there. There have been ugly accusations on both sides of it, but Max Miller is currently married to the daughter of Bernie Marino, but I am told that that divorce is gonna be final pretty soon. There was a dispute about child custody. I'm told they've come to an agreement on that and possibly within this month that divorce might be final. They are no longer living together and from what we understand, Bernie Moreno purchased a home for his daughter in Westlake and she and the child are now living there from what we know. Right. So it's not it's a sticky situation and probably not the ideal thing you want to be dealing with when you're coming into the home stretch of a major election. Yeah, probably uh, not. Uh, best of luck to the family and the child. Mm -hmm. OK, well, you got another race here you want to talk about. And this one's with Chantel Brown. This is Ohio's 11th district. What makes this one interesting to you? Yeah, so uh, this is Chantel Brown. She's the incumbent. She's mm -hmm. running against Alan Rappaport, a Republican and Sean Freeman, an independent. Plus, there are also two other right in independent candidates. Uh, Speaking of Majestic Hall, she was supposed to have an early voting event at Majestic Hall, mm. but from what I'm told, Democrats caught wind of that, flagged that because they are not interested in sending money to Tony George, who has spent a lot of money supporting Republicans. Not interested in being associated with that apparently right, right now. Right, the okay. rooster actually posted about that on social media, a uh, great follow on X if you're not following the rooster. And what do we know about this Republican candidate, Rappaport? Well, he was Cleveland Heights mayor for three terms in the 1980s and had previously sought a Cuyahoga County Council seat as a Democrat and then as state legislature as an independent. So kind of flip-flopping around between the different political parties. And the thing that we've seen as of late is that he said the Democratic Party that he formerly identified with became progressive and no longer welcomes moderates or conservatives. All right, so those are your options there. And we'll uh, we'll keep you updated on those races. We should have some better polling on that within the next week or so, hopefully, because people are actually starting to uh, do some polls now. It's fi they're finally getting around to <laughs> About it. About time. Thanks, everybody. We have an update on a, a very interesting Ohio legal case that's been uh, a part of our lives now for like six months or so, more than that, because this had to do with issue one last year and foreign money and how foreign money can or can't be spent in Ohio elections. Yeah, and this is something that came up in that Ohio General Assembly special session. Mm. So the punchline here kind of is that Ohio can ban green card holders from political contributions to state ballot campaigns. That was basically what was at issue here. But this was kind of under the umbrella of a law that was said to overall ban foreign contributions to state ballot issue campaigns. Mm -hmm. And the green card issue was kind of like a sticking point that had this law initially thrown out. But now a federal court of appeals has said, actually, that's fine. It's a little stickier situation in that case, as opposed to being somebody who's just living in a foreign land and donating money randomly to an Ohio, you know, uh, any, an Ohio attorney general race or something mm -hmm. like that. If you have a green card, that means you actually do have the legal right to at least be in the United States. And you, I don't know if you're considered a temporary citizen of some sort. So it just made it a little bit. Can you actually ban somebody who has the legal status to be here currently from donating to politics? And apparently this. Uh, these judges say that they can. Yeah, the Federal Court of Appeals says that you can because a green card holder is a lawful permanent resident, mm -hmm. not a citizen, which also means you can't vote in Ohio being a green card holder. So what the Federal Court of Appeals said was, quote, if the goal is to prevent foreign influence, extending the ban to all non-citizens, including lawful permanent residents, is the most effective means of advancing that goal. So if you're wondering why we saw this law get passed uh, by the Republican General Assembly this summer, it's tied to issue one, the redistricting amendment. Mm -hmm. And it's been tied actually to issue one three times now. Different issue ones. <laughs> different issue ones. Yep, but you're right. The special election in August, last November's election issue one, and this issue one, which is about redistricting and getting rid of badly, badly gerrymandered voting districts here in Ohio. Boy, we I need like, everybody needs civics classes, social <laughs> study classes. This is all very hard to follow and I sympathize with everyone and I'm sorry, but yes, this has to do with three different issue ones, all with different purposes 
and now we've settled that you can't be a foreign person and send us money for send money to Ohio politics, not even if you hold a green card. So that's taken care Which of, right? Which was already a law in the books here in Ohio. Still, now we m really made sure of it. <laughs> so how, how are the people who are trying to pass this, uh, this issue one, the, the amendment, how are they reacting to this? Uh, they seem unbothered. Mm -hmm. So Citizens Not Politicians is the group behind issue one, and Chris Davey is a spokesperson for that effort. And this is a quote from Chris Davey. This ruling has no impact on our campaign to end gerrymandering in Ohio because our campaign has not and will not accept any contributions from foreign nationals with or without HB1. That was already the law in Ohio. So HB1 is this law that you know we were talking about there. So it does not seem too shook or at least is portraying that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's so. So we've cleared that up. Now I've got to ask you about this other this is this is uh, another thing that I really need you to unravel for me. This is this has to do with federal pandemic unemployment assistance money that apparently almost a billion dollars that Ohio is currently leaving on the table and saying, no, thanks. You go ahead and keep that. I think we got everything. Everything's taken care of here in Ohio. Yeah. So if you remember, I'm being a bit hyperbolic, obviously, please go on back in the pandemic, back in the pandemic. You know, we were both furloughed for a week. Lots mm -hmm. of people were temporarily laid off or they're working establishments closed or whatever. Right. So you could get state unemployment money and then the federal government was also kicking in money mm -hmm. on a weekly basis. Now, if you remember back to the summer of 2021, Ohio opted out of that additional federal assistance for July, August and September. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lawsuit going on now. It's been going on for a while that's about to be settled. It could be settled any day now. And the question there is, whether or not Governor Mike DeWine was allowed to say, actually, no, we don't want that money, or if he actually is required by Ohio law to get all of that federal money and give it to Ohioans. So there's almost a billion dollars at stake, 320,000 Ohioans who would have received that money if not leaving the program early here in Ohio. And the attorney behind the class action lawsuit, his name is Mark Dan, and I got to talk to him about it. So here's that. Mark, thank you very much for being with us here on Ohio Has Issues. Well, thank, thank you for having me. So, Mark, you are involved in something that you're hoping to remedy for more than a quarter million Ohioans. So can you just give me the rundown of the lawsuit that you're involved in? Yes. Back in, in 2021, uh, when the pandemic was coming to an end, uh, uh, Governor DeWine made a decision that Ohio should reject certain funds that were being made available for people who were unemployed uh, and getting uh, uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, on the premise, I, I think that he articulated that, that we, we needed to fill jobs and that, uh, and that for some reason, people getting more money on unemployment would make that less likely uh, to be able to fill those jobs. Uh, that turned out not to be true, by the way, but for the last uh, 10 weeks of the pandemic unemployment program, uh, Governor DeWine turned down $300 a week that was available uh, to 320,000 Ohioans. Oh, okay. I remember this. I, during the pandemic, my company mm -hmm. that I work for, we had a furlough and we were able to collect state unemployment benefits during that week and then also supplemental federal money. So that's what this money is. That, that's right. There were, there were actually three or four different buckets of it, but it was one of the buckets. And, um, but what, what happened is we sued, um, uh, the court turned us down, we appealed. Uh, the, the appeals court reversed the trial court and said that uh, that the governor had a legal obligation to maximize uh, the unemployment benefits for Ohioans. That's right in the Ohio Revised Code. Um, they then appealed that to the Ohio Supreme Court. The Ohio Supreme Court uh, kicked it back to the trial court. Um, and the trial court um, had a hearing actually a couple years ago. Um, and we have now briefed the issue on uh, on a motion to dismiss. Um, and we're waiting for the judge to rule. But in the meantime, in, 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 in preparing ourselves, actually it was a motion for summary judgment, uh, to respond, we reached out to the U.S. Department of Labor. And the U.S. Department of Labor assured us in writing, uh, by way of an affidavit, that the funds, which is about $900 million for Ohioans, uh, was still available and appropriated, um, which was you know, a pleasant surprise, and that all Governor DeWine had to do is ask for it, and they will send it. Now, the emergency that he was worried about, whether he was right or wrong about that in 2021, is over with. Uh, so we now have a situation where the governor uh, could, whether we win our lawsuit or not, ask the Department of Labor to sh send that $900 million on for him to send on to 320,000 of, of, of the hardest working, poorest Ohioans. Uh, and, you know, and for the benefit of the people of the state, 
Um, my expectation would be people who are not rich, uh, who have been unemployed in their life, um, tend to spend their money rather than save it. Um, and so uh, they could use that to pay their debts. They could use it to to patronize Ohio businesses. They could use it to address some of the issues with inflation um, that that people are so concerned about. Um, and and that money and that would be instant. You could get an instant uh, influx of nine hundred million dollars into Ohio's economy. Why in the world he won't just voluntarily do this? I, I have no idea. But you know, we've spent literally years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal time uh, chasing this on behalf of the class of Ohioans um, that uh, that that were entitled to it. And and it's really it's really tragic. So this group of people who could potentially benefit from this. These are 320,000 Ohioans who were unemployed from July of 21 through September of 21. Is that right? That That's correct. It's a very, very narrow, narrow window of time. Um, uh, some other states' governors actually terminated the program earlier, um, but DeWine ultimately did it at the uh, at the end of the day. I think he was gearing up for his 2022 re-election campaign um, and wanted to shore up his base a little bit of people that uh, that didn't didn't care so much about people who were unemployed, but whatever the reason, um, I, I, you've got a you've got a responsibility under the revised code, and you have a responsibility as a human being that if you could move nine hundred million dollars into the hands of people that will use it to help another maybe another three three hundred or four hundred or million Ohioans in their businesses. Um, pay their lawyers, pay their, um, you know, pay, uh, you know, pay, pay their uh, credit card bills. Um, uh, why wouldn't one, one want to do that? Now we're hoping the court will order him to do that. And again, we're all we're asking the court to do is order him to ask. Um, and uh, and then the Department of Labor will do what they're going to do uh, with it. If it, if the money doesn't come, it doesn't come. But um, it shouldn't take a lawsuit in three years uh, to get uh, to get any public official to do. Uh, something which the revised code requires uh, that he's to do, and I'm not making that up. I mean, the Tenth District Court of Appeals has said that that the that that the uh, the way the statute, the unemployment statute, is written, uh, it was it, when it was written, it, it was designed to not be political, um, and so that's why it was it was written to say a, a, the the uh, Department of of, of Unemployment uh, at the time, or now the Department of Jobs and Family Services, and the governor. They have to do everything possible to take every get every possible benefit under unemployment for Ohioans, regardless regardless of the politics of that. It's a statutory obligation, and so um, you know. But instead, they they fight, they resist, they spend. You know, they're they're paying lawyers in the attorney general's office to fight it, um, and you know that's where we are. Now, let me ask you this. You said that you had reached out to the Department of Labor and were pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. the money is still there. If the governor yeah. were to ask for it, it would come yeah. to Ohio for those Ohioans. Do you have any idea if the governor never asks for this? If there's, in a hypothetical world, the court doesn't order him to comply mm -hmm. with the Ohio Revised Code as you have interpreted it and has the, mm -hmm. as the Court of Appeals has interpreted it. What happens mm -hmm. to that money if the governor never asks for it? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, yeah. I, it, well, at some point, I presume the U.S. Congress will reappropriate it. I mean, the the good news, I suppose, for for this situation is that our leaders in Washington are having a hard time agreeing on anything, um, including things like reappropriating funds that are unused. Um, in this case, it, it was, for whatever reason, they chose not to do that, even though there have been a couple of budget crises, uh, you know, during this last several years that we've been litigating this case. So every time. There's a, you know, there's a threatened government shutdown. We're worried that they're going to move that money um, to do something else. Unfor uh, but fortunately for, for, the, for our uh, members of the class and, and, the, and the representative clients we represent, that, uh, that hasn't happened yet. So, um, so assume, assuming Congress is ever able to make a decision again, um, they could reappropriate those funds. And we're talking about, you said, $300 a week, 10 weeks. So like $3,000 yeah. for these 320,000 Ohioans. Right. I mean, if you're even if you're a person making one hundred thousand dollars a year, three thousand dollars tax free, by the way, is uh, is oh, actually it's not tax free. So I take that back. But three thousand dollars, even if you have to pay taxes on it. it, it and by the way, the, you know, the state will get some of those tax dollars um, is is a lot of money. It, it could it could it could help buy your kid braces or pay your credit card bills or let you put a down payment on a car at a local Ohio car dealership. You know, uh, ironically, the Chamber of Commerce is, is, is filed an amicus brief opposed to us um, when I think that, that that this would be the best thing for Ohio business uh, in a long time. It would be it would, it would kind of like the sa sales tax holiday. I mean, it, it will give everybody an excuse to go out and spend a little money.
Interesting. Do you uh, do you know at the top of your hat what the Chamber of Commerce was arguing against when they filed a brief against this money being given to Ohioans as appropriated to them? Right. Well, they they, they, they continued to take the position, which which just the data uh, didn't didn't uh, support that uh, that people who were receiving unemployment benefits uh, were unlikely uh, to apply for jobs. I mean, and, and, and the fact is, anybody who's been unemployed uh, understands that that's not the case. At the end of the pandemic, there were still a lot of people who had uh, daycare issues uh, where they couldn't find uh, appropriate daycare for their children. I, I'm sure people can remember that. It wasn't that long ago. And so they just couldn't find they couldn't go back to work because they couldn't find somebody to take care of their children. Or uh, they had children or parents who were uh, were vulnerable um, with with respiratory issues and couldn't risk them going out in the workforce and coming home and bringing them COVID, which would which would be a death death sentence for a uh, an 85 year old uh, mother or grandmother with, with, with respiratory issues. And so that prevented them from going to work. It wasn't because people look, I have a lot of faith in the people in the state of Ohio. We are hardworking people and we want to work and people who are unemployed uh, on unemployment. That's the last place they want to be. They want to be out earning a living and, and being part of this community. And, and, and so uh, the presumption that, that, that I think the chamber of commerce and the governor made, that that somehow everybody was you know just sitting around with their feet up, uh, you know eating um, uh, Reese's cups and and, and watching TV, uh, it was just it, it was just a, an inaccurate stereotype. Because um, uh, I can tell you the stories I've talked to clients about how desperately they wanted to find daycare or how desperately they wanted to find a situation where they could work remotely so that they they, they wouldn't have to put, risk getting their 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 parents. Uh, 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 infected. Um, but, you know, if you're in the service industry, if you're a construction worker, if you're a, um, you know, you, there are just certain, certain industries where you can't not go to work and not expose yourself um, to those things. So if you have a health problem or if you live with somebody that does, th those were good reasons for people to stay home. And that's why Congress uh, and, you know, at the time, uh, President, uh, both Presidents Trump and Biden uh, signed bills that that allowed um, uh, that additional unemployment benefit to uh, to unemployed people during the pandemic. It was it was a good reason, and, and and so I just think the chamber got it wrong. And to be clear, this lawsuit is based on people who were definitively not working because they collected state unemployment benefits during that period. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with their status right now, whether they're working or not. Correct. That that that's correct. This is people who in two twenty twenty one were unemployed, and there was a lot more people unemployed. Uh, in 2021 than there, than, than there are now. And fortunately, um, so many of the people that would be eligible for this are, are actually back at, back at work. And so uh, not giving it to them is not giving them any incentive not to work because they're already working. Um, so now that to the extent that argument even had any any merit, it's 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 no longer it's no longer a thing. OK. And so uh, just to kind of wrap this up and talk about the status of the case right now. So now it's back mm -hmm. at the trial court level. You're waiting mm -hmm. for a either a hearing or a ruling from the judge. Tell me what's next and when you expect some sort of resolution. So that's a that's a great question. Um, the, the wheels of justice really do turn slowly, especially in this case. Um, uh, judge Holbrook has it on his desk. He's a F Franklin County comma police judge. It's fully briefed on the issue of summary judgment. We file for summary judgment. Uh, so has the state. Um, and so, and there's no dispute about the facts. Everybody agrees on the facts. The question is, how should the law be interpreted? And, uh, and so at any moment, that decision could come out. Every time I get a little notification in my email from the Franklin County Courts, I'm hoping it's, that that's the one. But uh, so far, so far, not yet. Okay. Well, we'll certainly keep an eye on it. Mark, thank you very much for breaking this down for us. We appreciate your time here on Ohio Has Issues. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much to attorney Mark Dan for being with us on that. Appreciate him breaking it down. And we have Governor DeWine's response from Dan Turney, DeWine's press secretary. The response is, the program reference was an emergency program. By nature, emergency programs are available during the emergency, but are intended to end when the emergency subsides. The July 2021 to 20, September 2021 time period referenced was after the pandemic emergency had ended. It began in March 2020 for reference. Ohio businesses had been open with minimal restrictions for about a year by that point. In recent years, including those in question, Ohio had more jobs, but more open jobs than workers to fill them, providing emergency supplemental benefits well after the conditions that necessitating them had ended was sending the wrong message when Ohio was open for business. But the policy the state adopted in acknowledging the, the reality that the pandemic emergency had long ended was good economic policy for Ohio businesses and Ohio workers, as well as Ohio consumers 
hard hit by price increases caused by supply chain disruptions and federal policy that caused inflation spikes. Okay. That's the word from Governor DeWine's office. The attorney in this case says that there could be a, you know, a ruling on this motion of theirs any day now. So we will see. So their contention, if you recall, I remember when they, when we started turning down the federal assistance, that money that was them saying, the, we got to get these people back up and back to work. And if we just keep subsidizing them like this, then they're never going to want to get back into that Costco with a mask on, you know? So that was what they did. And now we, this is, this is the result of that. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that, that clears that up. Thank you for that information. Of course. Okay. Let's get our vice president update. What's going on with that? Yeah. Minnesota governor, Tim Walls. He's the vice presidential candidate running on the democratic ticket. Mm -hmm. He was in Cincinnati last week at a campaign fundraiser. Mm. Uh, that fundraiser was held at the national underground railroad freedom center. That is on the Ohio river in downtown Cincinnati. Okay. What, anything interesting come of it or were there any interesting takeaways? Well, the most interesting takeaway actually that I took from Governor Wall's comments over the last week actually came from a California fundraiser. Oh, cool. So uh, at a California fundraiser, he said the Electoral College needs to go mm. in favor of a national popular vote, even though he acknowledged that's not the reality today. So no, no sort of insinuation there or anything that he wouldn't honor the Electoral College results or anything, but just says we're done. It doesn't make sense anymore. The Electoral College should go away. He's saying, I don't like it. I know I'm not going to, I'm not threatening, like I'm going to go and try and tear it down individually, but I don't care for it and I think it should go. Yeah. Uh, the Harris campaign kind of responded to that and said that that's not an official campaign position, but Vice President Harris, who's running for the presidential, you know, spot on the Democratic ticket, she said that she would previously had said she would be open to discussion about it. Okay. All right. Well, now we've got to talk about J.D. Vance. What's going on with him this week? Yes, our senator for Ohio and Republican candidate for vice president on that ticket, he said... Uh, this week that if elected again, Trump would try to end federal funding for Planned Parenthood. Okay, well, where's this at? He made these comments on Real Clear Politics. It was on Saturday night. He said, quote, we don't think that taxpayers should fund late term abortions. This has been a consistent view of the Trump campaign the first time around. It will remain a consistent view. Mm -hmm. So the executive director of Planned Parenthood Super PAC responded to that, that her name is Jenny Lawson. She said that federal funds can't be used to provide abortion care at any point in pregnancy and had a warning that taking those funds away from organizations, uh, from Planned Parenthood organizations across the country would, quote, rob millions of people across the country of vital, affordable care. Planned Parenthood, of course, this is no longer the quote. This is just me speaking factually. Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood, of course, is a, a pretty major provider for OBGYN care for people across the country. That's true. But I looked this up, and while it's abortion services are only about three percent of the services that Planned Parenthood actually provides, and since 1977, federal funding hasn't been used for abortions. A budget provision known as the Hyde Amendment pro uh, prohibits the use of federal funds for abortions, except in the case of rape, incest, or threat to the pregnant person's life. Yes. So. Uh, okay, moving on to a separate issue related to J.D. Vance and former President Donald Trump. Uh, the former president made some comments on a podcast that came out this week talking about how Mike Pence didn't do what was right mm. in uh, refusing to overturn the 2020 election, talked about him not having courage and those kinds of things. So that's a bit of a concern for people because some people are worried that Vance might not honor the electoral process if former President Donald Trump were to get reelected and there were to be any kind of, you know, issue moving forward or whatever might happen in this upcoming election. Um, I do feel like people would probably be a little bit less nervous about that had he had a better response at the end of that debate when they were asking him who won the past the last election and he refused to say uh, the, the truth, which was that right. Joe Biden won the election. Yes. So I think that that probably makes people a little bit more leery about him is if he outright refuses to say who who won in 2020 or who lost in 2020, what's that mean for this upcoming one? Yeah, bit of a con bit of a concern for people based on that comment by former President Donald Trump. Yes. Okay, I got to get me my Don Kissick update. Don <laughs> Kissick is the independent running for the Senate here in Ohio. Uh, and he's, wait, is he a, he's a libertarian candidate or independent? He is the libertarian, libertarian candidate. Libertarian candidate, great. Okay, so Don Kissick, we still don't have a lot of information on him. He has not been very active with us, at least, communicating, but we are still pretty reliant on his website that was still up from 2018 from a different campaign. And did you find any good Don, Don Kissick nuggets? Well, I figured today we would read you what he has written about civil liberties, Great. which for all intents and purposes, we believe to be from 2018. Mm -hmm. So 
An uncomfortable conversation must begin in America. Civil liberties are on the ropes in our country. Federal programs, principally law enforcement grants and others, such as Program 1033 of the National Defense Authorization Act, designed to furnish surplus military-grade gear, promote increased militarization of law enforcement agencies at all jurisdiction levels. Such federal programs have incentivized policies that emphasize generating crime statistics through convictions by any means over bringing real criminals to justice. The result is a log-jammed court system, overcrowded prisons, and steadily rising tensions between the law enforcement community and the neighborhoods and communities they are supposed to be serving and protecting. And that is Don Kissick's final word on civil liberties from 2018. There you go. I mean, take it and run with it, everybody. That's your Kissick update. There it is. Um, okay, I got to talk about those other Senate candidates in Ohio here, and that, of course, is Sherrod Brown and Bernie Marino. Um, that's the Republican and the, the Democrat and Republican, uh, respectively, unlike Don Kissick, who is a libertarian. And we're going to see what's going on with them. First of all, they both made a stop yesterday in Columbus. As you said, early voting just started, as we know, so they wanted to stop in Franklin County. So they pulled up right next, their tour bus is right next to the Frank, Franklin County Board of Elections, the first day of early absentee voting. And they gave, obviously, very differing views of why they chose to be uh, in Columbus on that on that date. Not a very popular place for Republicans right there. It's a very Democratic Democrat area. So um, it was it, Marina went to, into some unfriendly territory. It did get a little heated between uh, they, they were not there at the same time. They were there hours apart, but in the same location. And some uh, some of the people some hung holdover. around. There was some holdover and there's some uh, chipping going at it. Apparently after Brown's speech, uh, his advocates and Marino's physically faced off for several minutes in a noisy, often nasty debate, and some cops had to break it up. Mm. At one point, there was a brief physical confrontation, um, but again, nobody got hurt. Uh, and uh, Brown, t uh, Brown told, his do uh, told dozens cheering him on that he has become a target, and it's the price of challenging special interests. That's one of his things. He says, but you know, here's a quote, but you know what, when you devote your whole career to taking on people that are trying to screw middle class workers and are attacking unions, you know what happens, they come after you. He's also mentioning how expensive this, this uh, particular campaign is. And I have not fact checked this, but it sounds right. According to everybody we're talking about, political reporters that we've talked to around, uh, around Cleveland and Ohio, Columbus, Brown said that, quote, get this, we've had more money spent against me in this Senate race than any Senate race in the history of the United States of America. Wow. That's pretty crazy, if that's legit. And it, if not, it sounds like it would be pretty darn close. It tracks. Okay. Um, the incumbent, no, oh, here's one more thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, this, is, this is a Bernie Moreno quote from his appearance. Quote, look, it's no surprise. This is the party, the Democrat party, that fought freeing the slaves. The Republican party did that. It's a party, that of Jim Crow. It's a party of the KKK. Look, it's just a natural transition of what the party is all about, he said. Um, so different messages there. That was from... Um, that was from his uh, Tuesday speech. I am just scratching my Capitol. head about that. Okay, Whoa. now you, I know we all are. It, okay, but there were some other messages too. But that was that was the thing that really stuck out for me. I thought that that was interesting. Okay, according to you, you might want to know about how they're polling. I would love to know about how they're polling. Speaking of early voting, Please. though, um, Bernie Moreno did have his early voting event at Majestic Hall. He had that on the morning this at the, week at the George Place. Okay. Yep. Um, so we actually have it's it's we most of the polling we've seen, which has been pretty sparse, as you know has been uh, two or three points ahead for Sherrod Brown typically, and that's even with the cumulative polling and whatnot. New polling from National Republican Senatorial Committee, so take that with a grain of salt. It is the Republican Senatorial Committee, but a poll has Brown and Moreno deadlocked at 46% with less than a month ago, with trend lines moving in Moreno's direction since the spring. This, this is the same poll that had Brown leading by seven points in April, so a real shift there, obviously. Okay. Brown seen his image take a hit after a barrage on the airwaves. Remember, Bernie Moreno's, you might have seen a couple of ads as of late, viewers at home, One or two, perhaps. or um, 200. Ber uh, Shared Brown, we discussed this earlier, used a lot of his ads and ad money early in the summer, trying to establish Bernie Moreno early on, whereas Bernie Moreno just started spending and is just unleashing a ton of money right now. So the contention is that Republicans, well, Republicans outspent Democrat groups by 41 million, 91 to 50 million during September. Wow. That's a big difference right there. And that's, that, that makes it the most expensive uh, Senate race in the country. Here's one thing that's buoying Republican confidence is the fact that this is moving this way in this direction right now for Bernie Moreno because they're looking at this, the, the um, election between J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan. Tim Ryan, that was two years ago for the Senate seat that J.D. Vance now holds. Tim Ryan held a pretty decent lead, a couple point lead through the better part of the summer and into the fall. And it wasn't until the end that he clean, cleared up the difference. People came home 
and he ended up, uh, Vance ended up winning that seat, although not by a huge margin. He de defeated him by 6.5, which is still obviously better, but it's not Trump numbers. These are, Trump won this state, Ohio, by eight points in both uh, 2016 and 2020, so he is pulling behind the former president. Oh, and wow. that's what we know about that. Okay, and you know I love polls. I do, you do. One more recent Ohio-based poll that I want to look at. This one's pretty new. This is from Baldwin Wallace and uh, had some pretty interesting results about our state. This is a survey of 877 registered voters across Ohio. This is conducted from September 30th to October 1st. This is pretty recent by our poll standards. Yeah. And essentially the highlights, the, the, the top line is that there's a frustration, believe it or not, with political leadership and surprising alignment with some policies often seen as progressive, even as Ohio is considered to be a red state. For example, education. More than 80% support teaching lessons on the history and impact of race and racism in the U.S. That's 80% of Ohioans. This is when we're here getting all this pushback to critical race theory and whatnot. Don't you dare teach our students or kids anything. So it's, we, it's just interesting to hear that 80% of our supposedly red state is comfortable with teaching uh, racial history. Um, reproductive rights, 50, this lines up perfectly with issue one last year. 56% of Ohio voters say abortion should generally be permitted with some limitations, directly in line with the 56.8% of Ohioans who voted to enshrine reproductive rights last year. So that makes sense. Makes this poll seem a little more legit to the micer. Mm -hmm. Climate change. Two thirds of Ohioans, Ohio voters believe human activity is at least partially responsible for global climate change, which of course you know that's true and I know that's true, but mm -hmm. I'm happy that at least 66% of Ohioans are acknowledging that's true. Now, that's progress. Finally, yeah. and the reason that I bring this one up is because of our guest. This one's on gun control. Okay. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll do a little, uh, I want you to take a guess. Despite Ohio's permissive gun law, Stephanie, what percentage of Ohioan respondents to this poll uh, our favor expanded background checks for gun buyers aged 18 to 21. Oh, I bet it's high. What do you think? I'm just guessing it's high. I'm gonna say 56%. It's 86% of respondents wow. favor expanded background checks. Again, that's for uh, people 18 to 21. Okay. So that's not everybody, uh, but that's so th those were the qualifications they offered. And, so that was pretty high. 75% uh, support raising the minimum age to buy an AR-15 style. Those are the ones that are so popular in mass shootings. Mm -hmm. The AR-15 style from 18 to 21. If you're 18 right now, you can buy an AR-15. You cannot buy a Bud Light Lime. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Um, and then finally, last, last gun one, three quarters of voters also support red flag laws, which allow temporary removal of guns from individuals who are deemed dangerous. Uh, and um, yeah. And a ban on all AR-15 semi-automatic rifles is 56% in Ohio. That's interesting. So some surprising numbers from Ohioans because we are known as a red state. So it's just interesting seeing some of that line up, which leads us perfectly though into, should you, Stephanie, be able to drink uh, five drinks and then um, get into some gun play in a bar, in your opinion? I'm gonna say um, I'm not for that. I'm, I'm opposed to that. Okay, well, it's illegal in most counties of Ohio right now, but currently it's legal to drink and uh, have your have your weapon with you. Have it on you. On you. Concealed in three different counties in Ohio. Did okay. you know that? I didn't know that. It's based on a recent court case that I talked with Jake Zuckerman about from Cleveland.com that I found fascinating. Let's hear from Jake. Jake Zuckerman, thank you for joining us again. Appreciate all of your work and this latest column really caught my attention. Are you ready to get into it? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, gun laws in Ohio, some they can be a bit lax and it seems like even more so over time. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I think our state legislature over the past about 20 years has very steadily deregulated guns in Ohio. And and you you're writing now about just another effort to do so or I guess it's not an effort, it's something that's going down that could cause Ohio laws, Ohio gun laws to loosen even further. Why don't you go into what that is and what it has to do with the rights of drunk people to carry guns into bars? Yeah, yeah. So we, we really got to go back to 2022. It's when the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decided in this case, it, Bruin versus New York State Pistol Association. I might be bungling the party's names there, but the gist of it is the Supreme Court took up this case and the actual facts of the case aren't all that important for our purposes. But, but they are very entertaining. I will point that out. Maybe not important, but very entertaining. We might get into it. Go on. Well, so this, the U.S. Supreme Court said basically for a gun law, the new standard for a gun law, whether it's constitutional America is does it fit in with the historical traditions of our founders? So it rephrased, it's kind of like, did the founding fathers 
envision a law like this? Did any laws like this exist at the time of the founding? So uh, a lot of judges have criticized the ruling because it, it's forced them to become historians and prosecutors have, you know, gone from explaining the law to just taking up the 1700s area laws right. from the Commonwealth of Virginia. But so anyway, in any event, that is now the legal arena. And Ohio has had this long-standing law in the books that says you cannot, you, you can carry a concealed weapon into a bar if you have a permit. And now all citizens are presumed to be owning a permit because we have constitutional carry via the legislature. Hmm. But you lose that right, even with a permit, when you start drinking alcohol. I think that the, the rationale behind that's simple enough. People and that's that. already on the books. That That's something that already exists in Ohio law. That is already on the books. And now in Muskingum County, there was a man named Elijah Stricklin who was in a bar. He bought at least five drinks, although the record is actually silent as to whether or not he was drunk. I'll, I'll leave it to people to use their imaginations, what sure. five drinks will do to you. At two in the morning, he goes to the bathroom. There are some contested events about or contested takes about what happened in the bathroom. But in any event, a fist fight breaks out. He ends up shooting a man in the neck. Who did not die, but you know it's a shot to the neck. Very serious incident. He's charged with a, a series of crimes and ultimately pleads guilty to having gun in a bar, you know, while consuming alcohol and causing panic. A uh, charge related to causing panic, but he's challenging that first charge I mentioned. And the gist of the challenge is that under the Supreme Court ruling, the founding fathers didn't have laws, at least so he says about whether or not you could have guns while drinking. So he wants to take out Ohio's Ohio's law. Right now, the Muskingum County prosecutor is fighting that at the Supreme Court. His, his opinion is, for one, Ohio's law, it actually lets you carry a gun in a bar. It only doesn't let you carry a gun in a bar when you begin drinking. So he's saying it's, it's very narrowly tailored. In the appellate courts, he put in arguments uh, showing laws in the 1860s when there were some of these similar laws on the books to spare some legalese here, there's dispute for whether you need to look to the, the 1790s or the 1860s, Civil right. War back stuff. To the, about, back you know, to the about, Tombstone days, whether or not you can bring a, gu a gun into Tombstone and whether you got to leave it with Doc Holliday. I mean, th that is that is where jurisprudence is on this issue. That is what the courts are, are directing parties to, like how, how these cases are to be handled. It's where, how did the founders consider this problem? And in any event, this apology, this uh, this would be Muskingum County and two nearby counties whose names escape me, but those judges in that circuit held that yes, this Ohio law does violate this U.S. Supreme Court precedent, therefore it cannot stand. So that ruling only spans those counties, but the U.S. I'm sorry, the Ohio Supreme Court has taken up the case. So this Ohio Supreme Court's ruling on this issue could ultimately knock down that law or let it stand, but just following the logic of Bruin you could see how it's at least somewhat likely that it falls. Now, this now goes, oh, and they had their choice whether or not to take this case up. Do, what, what do we know about the judges other than where they're from? Do we know anything about the judges who have um, have ruled in favor of the, the gun owner here? I don't, I don't know about the appellate judges. One thing I would note in reading too much into the Ohio Supreme Court case, taking the case up, is if the appeals court had said, no, we don't buy this argument at all, then maybe you could read into the Supreme Court's action here. But in any event, right now you have a state law that spans 85 of 88 counties. So the, the Supreme Court really is in some ways almost forced to take it up. So some lawyers in the case did caution against that kind of, well, they're taking it up, therefore they're going to knock this law down. But as far as the state Supreme Court goes, right now it is in Republicans' hands and Republicans have been very explicitly and by their actions uh, friendly to friendly to gun policies, friendly to gun deregulated policies. You've mentioned that, that it's really been over the past 20 years that things have really sped up. Um, can you go through a little bit of how the laws have changed in recent times? Yeah, I think one big one, uh, it's commonly referred to as stand your ground law and what that law basically says. So you previously had this right in the home of that if you feel that someone has invaded your home, and this is a very, very old concept in law. If someone has invaded your home as a threat to you and your family, you have a right to respond with lethal force. And what Stand Your Ground did is, is it really expanded that to all places. So any place where you have a lawful right to be, if I'm on the town square, if I'm in a, a business where I have been invited into that business and someone starts threatening me, I think they're going to harm me, I think they're going to harm my family or someone else, I have a right to respond with lethal force. So if I if I shoot and kill them and convince a jury that no, I had a very legitimate reason to to fear for my life here, 
then I'm legally protected. Uh, yep. So that, that's one instance. There's also, like I mentioned earlier, permitless carry or constitutional carry that just presume, you know, previously you would need a license, which required certain training and a background check to carry a weapon concealed on your persons. Now, anyone who is lawfully allowed to possess a weapon is assumed to be presumed to be able to conceal, carry it concealed on the persons. And you also, since like the founding of the state, you have open carry rights in Ohio. So you can just openly carry a pistol around on your hip. It does seem that it could be problematic for the gun laws becoming more permissive in this way, particularly when combined with each other uh, with this latest one. Like you just said, we have stand your ground laws, which means if I feel threatened, it's my right. I, it's, it's subjective. It's up to me. If I feel threatened, then it's my right to defend myself with my gun rather than try and run away. When you're in a bar, I mean, people famously get those beer muscles up. And if you are drinking, that's not when you're obviously in your best state of mind. That might be when you be, are, become a bit more easy to enrage. And then you could legally pull out your gun after drinking, should this become a uh, statewide law. Pull out your gun while drinking. If somebody's just walking across the bar at you and you feel uh, threatened in some way, shoot them and get away with it, right? Well, I'd add there that you do need to convince a jury that you did feel threatened and you had legitimate reason to feel threatened. But but yeah, in general, what you're talking about is right. I One thing I'd add here is that when I talked to Buckeye Firearms, which is the prominent gun lobby in the state, that was a lot of what they said. They said, we, we agree with the plaintiff here. We think this law is invalid because it, it doesn't look to intoxication. They seemed, you know, implicitly they're saying... Yeah, you shouldn't be drunk while you're carrying a gun, but you can have one beer, maybe two beers, depending on your size and timing, and not be drunk. And they're saying that that person should still have a right to be able to stand their ground, defend themselves against an attack in a bar, and you should not lose that constitutional right to carry a weapon just because you had one drink or two. But I'll add here that there's a big evidentiary problem there, however you feel about the underlying policy. Like, like I said earlier, that in this case, we know that this person consumed five drinks. Mm -hmm. But was he drunk? There was no breathalyzer taken. There, you know, there's no evidence that he's drunk. We just have this kind of common sense inference that, well, he had five drinks, he's probably drunk. That might not cut it to. So if this Buckeye firearms policy holds, the prosecutor is going to run into this wall. You know, the man fled the scene after he shot this person's neck. So he was never able to be breathalyzed. So that would probably mean he wasn't drunk per se under the law. So therefore he was allowed to have the gun. So you can see why prosecutors, even in like a very conservative area of the state, like Muskingum County, are very uneasy with this. The Muskingum prosecutor said to me, I'm paraphrasing here, but guns and alcohol are a bad mix. It's obvious. Right. Do we have any word from any sort of Ohio's police enforcement? Any of any any uh, any of the police in Ohio have they remarked on this potential law? Or I know that they've been. Uh, they were, for example, at least some departments were not too crazy about the new open carry laws where you don't even or you don't have to have a license yeah yeah the fraternal order of police did like you mentioned they've opposed uh permitless carry i can't recall if they opposed stand your ground i'd have to check the facts on that one uh to my knowledge they have not weighed in on this present case but it was just accepted by the supreme court recently it hasn't been briefed i i would expect that they would want to file amicus briefs and, and have their their point of view heard here okay so where does this go from here do you have any idea of a timeline no, you know, I think there's going to be a new court pretty soon, you know, unavoidably, there are going to be new justices on the court. So I'm going to guess they're not going to start hearing these cases for a little while until the new justices said it, and it's going to need to be briefed. There will probably be oral arguments. It's it's going to be a little ways, but this is a hot one. This is a live round now. Do you have any, uh, do you have any way to compare it to other states? Have you compared, are there any other states with similar laws like this? Yes. Yeah, so what, what's on the books here? It's a very common law. I mean, I, I think you can just you know, even pro-gun people like, yeah, recognize that alcohol and guns, dangerous combination. A lot of states have laws like this. And in a lot of those states, there is a flood of lawsuits like this. I mean, this is just one of many. It, it's hard to, to really comprehend just how radical the, this U.S. Supreme Court's Bruin decision was in terms of reshaping and, and just totally overturning what is an allowable gun regulation in the United States. So now, you know, Prosecutors are going to be scrambling through his early history books, old statutes, trying to find something to say, no, 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 look, even the founders understood you, you don't want to drink too much ale before a duel. I don't know. You know, I mean, you see where I'm going with this. That's a good point, Jake. All right. Uh, this is great. Thank you. What else are you working on this week? Doesn't have to be gun related. Um, what do you uh, what do you got your eye on in Ohio? 
I have been interviewing some of the candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court, and I will be rolling out some profiles of those races soon. So Cleveland.com. Look forward to checking it out. Thanks so much for your time, Jake. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jake, for the good work. Appreciate it. Stay vigilant. Yeah. Well, interesting talk about our Ohio Supreme Court. We'll see what happens there. Could go either way. Who knows what will happen. But that's kind of actually a good uh, sort of way to tee up our next show. Oh, what's that going to be? You know, there are three Ohio Supreme Court races on the ballot this November. If you already voted, you know that. But if you haven't already voted and we're kind of catching you when you're still trying to make your decision about mm -hmm. this, we're going to be talking with at least three of those Ohio Supreme Court candidates. Oh, wow. So you reached yep. out to everybody who's running. I did. And three of them got back to you and are actually going to speak with you and, and give and give you their pitch. Yeah, well, they'll give and ultimately give you their pitch, okay? So one of the candidates running for the seat that's currently held by Justice Melody Stewart will be speaking with us. That is Democratic candidate Justice Melody Stewart. I've got an interview booked with her. Mm -hmm. Haven't heard back yet from her challenger, also incumbent, Justice Joe Dieters. Come so, on, Joe. Hoping that we hear back from Joe Dieters. Justice Dieters, she's waiting. Would really, really love that, Joe. So if you're watching, we shouldn't be calling you Joe. Justice Dieters, if mm -hmm. you're watching, we Your would Honor? love to speak Your with Honor. you. Your Honor. Sure. Um, there is another race, which is for the seat currently held by Justice Dieters. That was an appointed seat. So mm -hmm. he is vacating that, that seat one. to try and get a full term seat. And the people who are running for that are Democratic candidate Lisa Forbes of the 8th District Court of Appeals, and then also Republican candidate Dan Hawkins of the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. So I'll be speaking with both of them. Okay, cool. So that's great because they're, you know, going head to head. So happy for that. Final seat. Have not heard back yet from the people who are running for the seat currently held by Justice Michael Donnelly. Mm. So he's the Democratic incumbent, and the challenger is Republican Hamilton County Court of Common Pleas Judge Megan Shanahan. So hoping to hear from them. You're your honors, what are you waiting for? Mm -hmm. We've got to talk to Stevie. We would love to Want to help hear get the word you. out about you, so please get get in touch. We really would. And um, for the ones that don't get back to us, we're going to have Ohio Capital Journal reporter Megan Henry to kind of fill in the gaps, but would really Great. like to hear directly as well. Well, that sounds like an episode that no one should miss if they care about Ohio and politics. You heard that right from Mr. Mike Polk Jr. And you don't want to really miss any of our shows. We've got three more regular shows left before the Tuesday, November 5th election night special, which we will be here with you until we drop or until the 11 p.m. news comes on, whichever comes first. In the home stretch, folks. Thanks for sticking with us. This is Ohio Has Issues. We'll see you next week.